Think of the Lord saying to St. Peter, you know, when you were a young man, you tied your own belt when, where you wanted to go. Okay, but when you're an old man, like Abraham, uh, someone else will tie you up and take you where you don't want to go. Well, the someone else is the Holy Spirit. And so the, the salvation story, in a way, begins with this man who was willing to listen. And so we call him the father of faith. That's what it means, I think. Faith here, in the really primordial sense, means trust. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host and the senior publishing director. We are back together with Bishop Barron to discuss Genesis. We're continuing our series on understanding Genesis. Today we're going to learn about one of the central figures, not just of the Bible, but of the whole Western tradition, namely Abraham. And we're going to try and understand that really pivotal, prickly episode where it seems God is commanding Abraham to kill his own son. How do we make sense of all that? That's what we'll be discussing here. But before we do, Bishop, good to see you. Welcome. Hey, Brandon. Always good to see you. I'm glad to be home after a lot of weeks of traveling around. I was on, I think, five separate trips the last about six weeks. Yeah, let's talk about some of that. It's been a while yeah. since uh, we've connected and updated listeners on where you've been, what you've been doing. Um, so let's talk about a couple of the big events among those five. One was a trip to West Point. Uh, yeah. What were you doing there? Loved it. You know, I spoke at the Naval Academy about a year ago, and then I guess the word got out, so the Army invited me to West Point. And I was delighted to go. I'd never been to West Point. But I, you know, I'm a kind of a history buff, and I love military history, so just going to that place was fascinating. We got a wonderful tour of it. Then I gave a talk that evening to the cadets in the, in the great chapel at West Point. Then the next day, uh, I went to a football game, and it turned out to be the highest scoring game in the history of that stadium. It was like they were playing Wake Forest, and Army lost, but Army scored 56 points and lost by two touchdowns. They lost 70 to 56, so it was like the highest scoring game ever. So I saw that, and then that evening I had mass at, there's a Catholic chapel right on the campus of West Point. Had a chance to meet some of the um, Catholic cadets, and I just, I loved it. It was a great trip. It's like a basketball score, 70-something. It was, yeah. 50-something. That's, right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, another big event, one of the highlights, I think, of the year for Word on Fire was this big Good mm. News Conference, which I was Love happy that. to help host down here in Orlando. Everyone yeah. came down to Orlando for the conference. We had, I think, 570-ish uh, people from all over the world, mostly Word on Fire fans and followers. There was speakers, including yourself, Father Mike Schmitz, Chris mm -hmm. Stefanik, um, we had Abbot Jeremy Driscoll, a whole great, speakers, great, yeah. great lineup of breakout speakers. But for me, yeah. the best part of this was interacting with people who, who have been shaped, molded, formed by Word on Fire. And not just hearing their gratitude for Word on Fire, but seeing how they themselves are now evangelizing as a result yeah. of Word on Fire. Talk about your experience at this conference. I loved it. Uh, as you say, down in Orlando. And... Um, seeing a lot of the our, our own Word on Fire folks that I hadn't seen for a long time because of COVID and because I'm out here and you guys are in different parts of the country. So getting together with the team was a marvelous thing for me. And I spent, I think it was three and a half hours signing books. And what that enabled me to do is meet a lot of the people who came to the conference. I think I met two thirds of the attendees. Uh, and as you say, just sensing their excitement and sensing their enthusiasm for the evangelical you know, project. Uh, was marvelous. And the liturgies were great. Uh, the speakers were terrific. We had a chance. It'll be coming out soon. Uh, Father Schmitz and I sat down for a, a uh, recorded conversation just about the work we do and all that. So I, I just loved all those encounters. It was terrific. And it rained. It rained. You know, it never rains in California. I never see rain anymore. And so I think it was the first day of the conference. I had a little break in my room, and it was just pouring rain. And I sat on this little like little balcony off the room. And I just I just listened to the rain for like an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you came down and we're like, Bishop, did you get some rest? And you said, Yeah, I listened to the rain for an hour. We're like, Ooh, yeah. how philosophical. <laughs> I loved it. We it never rains out here in California, so I missed that. All right. Well, let's turn our attention now to Genesis. This is, I think, the third in our series on understanding Genesis. Mm -hmm. We explained during the first video, Genesis is maybe the most misunderstood text in the Bible. Lots of confusion of how to read this or that passage. So we thought we'd go through it almost passage by passage. Now we're 
up into you know the the tenth through twentieth chapters, roughly of of the book of Genesis. Um, we've talked about creation, uh, Adam and Eve, the fall. Uh, now we're going to be looking at Abraham and Isaac. The very first word that God speaks to Abram, remember that was his name first before it was later mm-hmm. changed, Abram, is that he has to move. Um, God says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will now show you. Abram must leave behind everything, everything he knows, and go to a country that he knows nothing about. You say that this is the the critical moment in Abraham's mm-hmm. Abram's life. He has to listen to the voice um, yep. In fact, you've said, I'm quoting you here, the entire narrative of the people Israel turns on this question. Do they listen or not? Say more about that. Yeah. Look, the thing begins with uh, creation, with God's great gift of, of the world and his, his desire that we share in the fullness of life. But he gives us that one command, you know, the one prohibition, which, of course, we don't listen to. So not listening to God, not listening to the divine word was the source of the problem. From that came the expulsion from the garden. From that came all the sins laid out in Genesis like now four through through 11. You have this description of all that goes wrong with the world. What we see now in the Abraham cycle of stories is the beginning of the rescue operation. That's why it's so important. We're a salvation religion, right? We're not just a, a bland mysticism. Christianity, biblical religion is a is a salvation religion. God has taken action to save us from the problem. Where does it begin? By someone who is willing to listen. So here's Abram, as you say, an old man at this point. He's 75, especially in the ancient world. That meant you were were ancient, 75. Settled in his ways. He's followed his own instincts and done what he wanted to do. And then comes this voice. This higher voice, beyond his own ego, beyond his own plans, a higher voice, the voice of God that summons him to obedience and to mission. Well, do you listen or not? The the stance of most of us sinners is to say, no, I'm going to resist that voice. I'm going to listen to my own voice. Man, today, in our culture, are you kidding? That's just massively on display. My voice, listen to me, respect me, don't tell me what to do, you know. Bible has no truck with that sort of thing. The Bible's interested in an openness to the voice of the unconditioned, the voice of the sumum bonum, the voice of, of God, which will always summon us outside of our, to use our cliche today, our comfort zone, right? He'll move us beyond what we're accustomed to, what we're willing to accept. Uh, think of the Lord saying to St. Peter, you know, when you were a young man, you tied your own belt when, where you wanted to go. Okay, but when you're an old man, like Abraham, uh, someone else will tie you up and take you where you don't want to go. Well, the someone else is the Holy Spirit. And so the the salvation story, in a way, begins with this man who was willing to listen. And so we call him the father of faith. That's what it means, I think. Faith here, in the really primordial sense, means trust. Are you willing, as a basic stance of your entire life, to trust in a higher voice? In that way, Brandon, every one of us is a son or daughter of Abraham right? We're all members of the Abrahamic family because we've said yes to this higher voice. That's why this cycle is so important. So God sends Abram off to this new land. When his family comes to Canaan, the Lord appears to him and says, to your offspring, I will give this land. And that theme then reverberates throughout the rest of Genesis. It's so centric on, on the land. Mm-hmm. And not just the land in the abstract, but a particular plot of land. You know, this plot of earth that's yeah. east of the Mediterranean, west of the Jordan, mm-hmm. from Dan in the north to Beer- Beersheba in the south. Why is this particular piece of land so important in Genesis? Well, in a way, it isn't. And what I mean by that is it's not so much this particular plot of ground. Here I'm following Matthew Levering, our great friend and a wonderful theologian, that the land functions here in the Old Testament as a symbol of of our flourishing in relationship to God. Let's put it that way. So think now the Garden of Eden, another place, but it's evocative of the life and fecundity and joy that comes from real friendship with God. Sin involves a loss of that place. The, The garden becomes a desert. So the the promised land, you might say, is the recovery of Eden. 
it's the recovery, you know, this land flowing of milk and honey. It's a place of, of full flourishing in friendship with God. See, so I would press it, again, following Matt Levering here, um, the land is evocative of the church. You know, the promised land is the space, the place of the church. Now I'll go even further, because the church is only an anticipation of what? Of heaven, where we are fully engaged in friendship with God. The, the land that is ultimately flowing with milk and honey is the land of heaven. So think of the plot of earth you were describing, you know, west of the Jordan, east of the Mediterranean, and so on. It's, it's a symbol, it's an anticipation, an evocation of salvation, of the garden that God wants to call us back into. So Abraham, Abram, at, again at the time, Abram yeah. is convinced of the Lord's offer of the land, but he quickly becomes worried that he has no physical heir. So him and his wife mm -hmm. are barren. But then God's word comes to him and says, Look toward heaven and count the stars. If you are able to count them, so shall your descendants be. You'll have as many descendants as there are the stars. Um, say a moment about that, and then I want to get to the, the seal of this covenant, which is yeah. um, a ritualistic thing. But say something about that promise first. Well, you know, whenever we come across that reading in the liturgy, whenever I come across it in my own reading, I find it deeply moving because, Brandon, it meant, go, go back in your mind's eye to this figure, that Abraham, Abram. Would he ever have imagined that two of those stars that he would see in the sky would be you and I, you in Orlando, Florida? He had no idea where that was. I in, in Santa Barbara, California, no idea where that was. Talking to each other by means of a technology that he couldn't have dreamt possible. But yet here we are, you and I, are both two of the stars in that firmament. We're descendants of Abraham because we're, we're born of the faith that he uh, exhibited. And so it's, the, it's all of the followers of Abraham across all of space and time. That's what the, those stars signify. And it's the, it's the beauty of God's providence that through this particular figure, this guy from Ur of the Chaldees, this 75-year-old man, the end of his life, but by his willingness to listen, he became the progenitor of this absolutely extraordinary spiritual family that includes us and will include people long after you and I are gone. You know, uh, there'll be stars that, that we can't imagine who will be descendants of, of Abram and his faith. And so I, I think that's just deeply moving. To seal that promise that your descendants will be as many as the stars, God then institutes this ritual. And I, I know a lot of my non-religious friends see that ritual mm -hmm. and think it's so crazy because what he yeah. effectively does is tells Abram to get a bunch of animals. I think it's like a, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, a, mm -hmm. a pigeon. Cut each of them in half, split the two halves apart, and then walk through them. Uh, what's going on here? How do we make sense of that? Yeah, read to Scott Hahn and others on this. The, the term that's often used in the Old Testament for the making of a covenant is the term cut, to cut a covenant. And they think it might be related to this ritual. The idea being, uh, may it happen to us what has happened to these animals if we break this agreement that we made. So the two covenant partners say, we're going to do this and that. Uh, you know, I'll do this for you, you do that for me, or I belong to you, you belong to me. And if we violate that, may we suffer the fate that these animals have suffered. They think that's one, one meaning of the cutting of the animals and then moving in between them. So what's lovely in this account is Abram does that, but also God does it in the form of that, you know, a flaming brazier and so on, that God himself becomes a, a partner in this covenant. He's cutting the covenant with, uh, with Abraham. And then that marvelous theme of covenant, I mean, go back before Abraham to Noah, but then it runs right through the whole scripture up to Jesus, of course, himself, this new and everlasting covenant that he's going to make. And, and we represent that every time we, we celebrate the Mass. I mean, so it's very resonant moment. But it's also this thing, Brandon, that, that all covenant in a fallen world will involve pain, right? Mm -hmm. So in a perfect world, I, I'm utterly without sin. I'm not conditioned by sin in any way. To, to walk with God is effortless. But see, I'm a sinner. I live in a sinful world. And so getting myself online with God will always involve pain. And so that's part of the symbolism of all uh, animal sacrifice, is that what's happening to this animal by right should be happening to me. 
that in the pain the animal's undergoing, it's my own spiritual kind of being twisted back onto line. I think that's part of the logic as well of, of all this sacrifice and covenant language. As you mentioned earlier, when we start this story, Abram's already an old man. I think he's in his mm -hmm. 70s. Um, but then when he turns 99, God reiterates his covenant with Abram and at this point changes his name. So that's when he moves now to the mm -hmm. famous Abraham, which means father of many. But yeah. as a sign of this covenant, God asks that every male in the family of Abraham be circumcised, which establishes thereby in the flesh this this divine covenant, this connection between mm -hmm. God and his people. I know a lot of people, even within the church, wonder, why circumcision? What does that have to yeah. do with God's promise? So how do we understand that? Well, I'd say a couple things, Brandon. First of all, look in, in, in the now very rich literature about the initiation rituals of primal people. So this is all over the world. When a young man is brought from his home and then he's moved through a whole series of challenges and so on, very typically in those processes, something like this happens, namely the scarification of the body. And in some cases, it is indeed circumcision. Other times, the scarring of the cheek or a knocking out of a tooth. Marking in one's body the fact that life is painful, life is hard, and you're going to be called upon to make sacrifices for the sake of your family and your society, that, that the days of your being coddled at home by your mother and father are over. It's time for you to assume responsibility. So in that sense, there's nothing uh, terribly unusual here. It's part of this, this signaling in one's body that there's something painful and demanding, right, about um, a mature relationship. But then press it further now in the more specifically uh, Jewish or Israelite context. The fact that the covenant is written and indeed cut, as I've used that term already, it's cut into the reproductive organ of, of a man uh, is very telling. So it's not just scarification of the cheek, let's say. You know, it, it, it's the fact that the reproductive organ of a man is involved shows that somehow this promise of God, this covenant of God, is going to take place through family, through reproduction, through the, you know, being fruitful and multiplying, right? That that's essential to what God wants to accomplish in his friendship with us. So the fact that it's marked not just in the flesh, but in in that particular part of the flesh is of, of great religious significance. Um, it's tied to, to the fecundity and fertility involved in um, God's covenant. When we're friendly with God, life comes from us in all sorts of ways, right? So circumcision, I think, is literally cutting into the flesh of someone a deep reminder of that truth. All right, let's move on from Abraham to Isaac. So Abraham and his wife, mm -hmm. Sarah, are in their upper 90s when suddenly they give birth to a son whom they name mm -hmm. Isaac. But then in this startling twist, uh, God demands that Abraham sacrifice his son as a burnt offering. This is often described as the binding of Isaac. Mm -hmm. I know this is a perennially tough episode in the book of Genesis for people. So help us understand why God, would, who is against murder and for life, why he would command Abraham to kill his own son, and, and even more, why would Abraham obey him? Wouldn't Abraham know that that's a bad thing to do? Uh, help us understand this. Probably still the best text for uh, interpreting this passage is uh, Soren Kierkegaard's great text called Fear and Trembling. And the title gives away the game. Kierkegaard says, if you read this text and you don't experience fear and trembling, you haven't read it right. In other words, you're reading it in a superficial way. You're finding some kind of easy excuse or easy answer. Uh, it's meant to produce in us something that's beyond our normal categories, whether they're philosophical or ethical, even religious, right? So there's something going on here that is deeply challenging to all of our assumptions. Let me try to say it as simply as I can. Something like this, that our dedication to God must be greater than any other dedication or devotion that we have, even to the best and highest and loveliest things. So here we are in the world, and, and we're drawn into the world because of its beauty and goodness and truth, and we make commitments to it, and we, we love it, we savor it. Good, good. 
But God is more important. You mean more important than my country? Uh huh. Therefore, you must be, if you have to, be willing to sacrifice your relationship to your country if God's calling you to something higher or deeper. Uh, my culture, there are all these wonderful things in my culture that I savor. Yeah, they're great. But the friendship with God is more important. And if it means I have to sacrifice even these things in the culture that I love, yeah, I, I have to be willing to do that. Now, press it further so it makes us really nervous. My wife, my husband, my kids. I mean, what? you're a father, Brandon. I mean, you in, in your bones, I mean, you have this visceral, visceral connection to your family. They're, it's the greatest good in this world, right? The greatest good. You'd, you'd happily give your life to defend your kids. I know that. My father would have died for me. I know that without the slightest hesitation. But the friendship with God is more important even than that relationship. Are you willing, therefore, to sacrifice, that is to say, to render secondary even that relationship vis-a-vis -vis God? The story, it seems to me, of the Akedah or the binding of Isaac is meant in this hyper-dramatic way to bring this right before our, our mind's eye. Um, to me, a parallel is always in, in the New Testament when uh, the man says to Jesus, you know, oh, Lord, I want to follow you, but, you know, first let me bury my father. Well, you know, I mean, come on. I, who would ever refuse that? Hey, you know, hey, Bishop, I, I'd love to come to your conference, but, you know, my dad died and I've got to attend the funeral. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, of course. But the fact that Jesus responds it, it seemingly so coldly to him, right, let the dead bury their dead. Uh, what's being signaled there is not his indifference to uh, this man's affection for his father. What's being signaled is, but the love of God is higher than even the highest loves we experience in this world. And are we willing, therefore, to sacrifice even those for the sake of what God is asking of us? Um, terrible truth? Uh-huh. And the terrible, it makes you tremble, right? Fear and trembling. Because it means you've got to be willing to let go of everything in this world for the sake of God, right? And, you know, let's, let's face it, every one of us, we're all going to die. We're all going to face the moment when we have to let go of everything in this world to, to enter fully into the friendship with the Lord. I think, Brandon, that's why the story is so great and so powerful and so disturbing because it's making this point in a sort of unavoidable, it's just in your face. But I think that's how the great tradition has, uh, has, has read it. Abraham's faith is complemented throughout the rest of the Bible, especially in the book of Romans, chapter 4. Paul says it was because of Abraham's faith that righteousness was accounted to him. And I, I often think of that line in light of this binding scene that Abraham, who had just been promised that his heirs would be as numerous as the stars in the sky, mm -hmm. and yet his only son he has to kill. And so it's it's like this test of faith where he just has to believe that some way, even though he has no conception of resurrection, some way that Isaac is going to be alive, even, even if he's killed here. Yep, that's why Kierkegaard calls it, calls faith the passion for the impossible. Now, mm -hmm. that's, it's kind of a Protestant way of doing it. It's a little bit dialectical and over the top, okay. But it's getting to your point. If it's real faith, it's calling forth a trust beyond our capacity to know and control. You know, it's like, Brandon, all these conversations, and whenever I get in these debates with people, with, with non-believers and atheists about the problem of suffering, you know, and of course, we can, we can all bring forward, you know, a million examples of terrible, uh, seemingly unjustifiable suffering. Well, I know, I know, and faith is a kind of passion for the impossible. It's, it's a trust even in the face of all of that, even acknowledging all that. Think of Abraham about to raise the knife to kill his own beloved son. I mean, talk about awful, awful suffering. But it's placed within the context of God's uh, purpose and that he demonstrates this trust, makes him the father of faith. And, and you could argue the fact that you and I, all these centuries later, are, are up there in the firmament of uh, Abraham's descendants is only because the 
sheer intensity of the faith that he demonstrated, of the trust that he demonstrated. Now flash forward to Jesus on the cross, right? God, my God, why have you abandoned me? But yet, yet, even there, I trust. That's the space we're being invited into by these, these dreadful and wonderful readings. Let's close with one more look at Isaac. So we actually yeah. don't know much about Isaac. Of the four no. major patriarchs in Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, Isaac yeah. is the least developed. Um, right. Other than this episode as a boy, there's not much when he's an adult other than his meeting with Rebecca, who becomes Rebecca. his wife, mm-hmm. and the story of their betrothal. Um, the discovery of Rebecca takes place at a well. Talk mm-hmm. about this and why it's significant. Yeah, a servant of, of Abraham goes and, and to find a wife for Isaac and finds her precisely by the well. And then, of course, in the story of Moses, he discovers his wife, Zipporah, by a well. So that in the biblical imagination, a well becomes a kind of trysting place, a place where, where husbands and wives meet. It's a place of marriage, if you want. And, you know, a well with all the, the associations of water and life and, you know, oasis and all that. Well, now flash forward to that remarkable scene in the Gospel of John when Jesus sits down by a well. Now, you're a Jewish reader in the first century. Right away, you know, your antennae go up like, okay, a well. That means this could be a place where a a tryst will happen. There'll be some kind of meeting, you know, of a husband and a wife. And, of course, to that well comes the Samaritan woman. And then there's that marvelous exchange. And it's read, the church fathers suggest, properly as a proposal of marriage. Because Jesus says to her, yeah, you've had you know, uh, five husbands, the one you have now is not your husband, that implicitly he's saying, I'm proposing that I become your husband, not in the, in the physical order, but in the spiritual order. It's Jesus, the, uh, the bridegroom, and the woman is the bride. So uh, Augustine reads her as the church coming from the many nations of the world. And they meet at this trysting place, a well, like Rebecca, like Zipporah, and it's now Yahweh, it's the God of Israel, in person uh, uh, seeking marriage with us, seeking to share intimacy with us. And that, of course, then calls to mind all the themes in Isaiah and many others, you know, is that the Lord will marry his people, that, that God will, will command his people or boss his people around or give them orders or make demands of them. That's in all the religions. But this weird, weird idea in the Old Testament that God says, I will marry, I will marry my people. Well, can we see in Isaac and Rebekah, in Moses and Zipporah, and then Jesus and the woman at the well, this marvelous marriage of God and his people? Uh, I think that's how, you know, John, whoever the author of John's gospel, there's debate about that, he was someone certainly immersed in the Jewish literary and theological tradition. He knew these texts and deals so artfully with them. So he tells that story with all these overtones and undertones, you know? And that's how I think we're meant to move into that story. Well, now it's time for our question from one of our listeners. And today we are hearing from Alex in St. Louis, who is asking about one of your favorite theological principles, namely the non-competitive transcendence Mm. of God. So here's Alex's question. Grace and peace to you. My name is Alex, and I live in St. Louis, Missouri, and my question is regarding God's non-competitive transcendence. Bishop, you've spoken on this several times uh, in response to Governor Cuomo, as well as just simply describing the nature of who God is and who God isn't. What sources uh, would you recommend Mm. to learn more about this concept uh, besides that par excellence, Thomas Aquinas? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for that. And you're right, it's one of my central ideas. And uh, I'll go first back in time. Uh, one of the most important sources is the great St. Irenaeus, recently declared a doctor of the church. Look in the Adversus Horaces, and you find over and over again, Irenaeus' claim that God doesn't need us. God doesn't need the world. And see, that sounds cold, but it's not. It's, it's, a, it's liberating good news. Because God is God, fully happy in himself and so on. It means he's not going to manipulate the world in any way. So he's transcendent to the world and non-competitively. The world isn't, isn't adding or subtracting to his being. God doesn't need something from the world, which means God can utterly love the world, right, with freedom of spirit. 
you're, you're right in suggesting Aquinas develops that in all sorts of ways. And I got the idea from my theological hero, Robert Sokolowski, when I was a young kid at Catholic University years ago, and he laid out that idea. So look in his book called The, um, uh, the God of Faith and Reason is the best place to find it, but it, it echoes throughout a lot of his writings. Uh, to me, it was an idea that shed light in every direction. And I didn't know at the time, when I was 21 years old and, and kind of grasping that idea for the first time, did it ever occur to me that a lot of my work and as a writer and as, a, as an evangelist and now the media and so on would hinge upon that idea? I don't think so. But I took it in with great delight. As I say, it, it sheds light on so many different aspects of the faith. So I'd say Sokolowski for contemporary, go back to Irenaeus for the ancient church. And where do you write about that, Bishop? It's in Priority of Christ pretty yeah, heavily, isn't it? Yeah, everywhere. Yeah, I, I bring that idea up in I guess, practically every, every book I've written, you know. Good. Well, thanks, Alex, for the question. And for all the rest of our listeners, if you'd like to ask Bishop a question, send it in to us at the website, askbishopbarron.com. Listen, as we get closer to Christmas, Word on Fire has a bunch of amazing deals on all of our books, films, products. Um, if you are looking for someone, something to give to a friend or a family member this Christmas, check it out. You can find it all at wordonfire.org. Thanks for listening to this Understanding Genesis series. Look forward to uh, the next episode where we're going to be focusing on the figure of Jacob. Thanks so much for listening and joining us, and we'll see you next time on the Word on Fire show. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I invite you to share it and to subscribe to my YouTube channel.